I am autistic. And what this means in practice is that there are some things that are easier for me than they are for most people, and a great many things that are somewhat harder. And these affect my life in more or less overt ways. As it goes, I'm pretty lucky. I've been able to build a career around special interests and granular obsession. My main gig at the moment is explaining superhero comics, continuity, and publishing history, for which work I am somehow paid in actual legal currency, <laughs> um, which is both a triumph of the frivolous in an era of the frantically pragmatic and a job that's really singularly suited to my strengths and also to my idiosyncrasies. I like comics. I like stories in general because they make sense to me in ways that the rest of the world and my own mind often don't. Self-knowledge is not an intuitive thing for me. What sense of self I have, I've built gradually and laboriously and mostly through long-term pattern recognition. For decades, I didn't even really have a self-image. If you'd asked me to draw myself, I would eventually have given you a pair of glasses and maybe a very messy scribble of hair, and that would have been about it. But what I do know, backwards, forwards, and in pretty much every way that matters, are stories. I know how they work. I understand their language, their complex inner clockwork, and I can use those things to extrapolate a sort of external compass that picks up where my internal one falls short. Stories, their forms, their structure, the sense of order inherent to them, give me the means to navigate what otherwise, at least for me, would be an impassable storm of unparsable data. Or, stories are a periscope, angled to access the parts of myself I can't intuitively see, or stories are a series of mirrors by which I can assemble a composite sketch of an identity I rarely recognize whole. Which is how I worked out that I was transgender in my early 30s by way of a television show. This is my story, and it's about narrative cartography and representation and why those things matter. It's about autism, and it's about gender, and it's about how they intersect. And it's about the kinds of people we know how to see and the kinds of people we don't. It's not the kind of story that gets told a lot, that you might hear a lot, because the narrative around gender transition and dysphoria in our culture is really, really prescriptive. It's basically the story of, of you know, the kid who has known for their whole life that they're this and not that, and that story demands the kind of intuitive self-knowledge that I can't really do, and a kind of re relationship to gender that I don't really have which is part of why it took me so long to figure my own stuff out. So to what extent this story, my story, has a beginning? It begins early in 2014, when I published an essay titled, I See Your Value Now, Asperger's and the Art of Allegory. And it um, explored, among other things, the ways that I use narrative and narrative structures to navigate real life. And it got picked up in a number of fairly prominent places that got linked, and I casually followed the ensuing discussion. And I was surprised to discover that readers were fairly, fairly consistently assuming I was a man. Now, that in itself wasn't a new experience for me, even though at the time I was writing under a very unambiguously female byline. It had happened in the letter columns of comics I'd edited. It had happened when a parody Twitter account I'd created went viral. When I was on staff at Wired, 
I budgeted for fancy scotch by putting a dollar in a box every time a reader responded um, in a way that made it clear they were assuming I was a man in, um, in response to an article where my name was clearly visible. And then I had to stop doing that because it happened so often I couldn't afford to keep it up. <laughs> but in all of those cases, the context, you know, the reasons were pretty obvious. The fields I'd worked in, the beats I covered, they were places where women had had to fight disproportionately hard for visibility and recognition. We live in a culture that assumes a male default, so given a neutral voice and a character limit, most readers will assume a male author. But this was different, because this wasn't just a book I'd edited, it wasn't a story I'd reported, it was me, it was my story, and it made me uncomfortable, it got under my skin in ways that the other stuff really hadn't. And so I did what I do when that happens, and I tried to sort of reverse engineer it, to look at the conclusions and peel them back to see the narratives behind them and the stories that made them tick. And I started this. I started this by going back to the text of the essay and you know, examining it in every way I could think of, looking at craft, looking at content. And in doing so, I was surprised to realize that while I, that I had written um, about a number of characters with whom I identified closely, and that every single one of those characters I'd written about was male. And that surprised me even more than the responses to the essay had. Because I spent my career writing and talking and thinking about gender and representation in popular media. In 2014, I'd been the feminist gadfly of an editorial department and multiple mastheads. I'd been a founding board member of an organization that existed to advocate for more and better representation of women and girls in, in comics, as characters and creators. And most of my favorite characters, the ones I'd actively seek out and follow, were women. Just not apparently, the characters I saw myself in. Now, I still didn't realize it was me at this point. Remember, self-knowledge, not very intuitive for me. And while I had spent a lot of time thinking about gender, I'd never really bothered to think much about my own. I knew academically that the way other people read and interpreted my gender affected, you know, had influenced a lifetime of social and professional interactions, and that those in turn had informed the person I'd grown up into during that time. But I really believed, like I re just sort of had in the back of my head, that if you peeled away all of that social conditioning, you'd basically end up with what I got when I tried to draw a self-portrait, so a pair of glasses, messy scribble of hair, and in this case, maybe also some very strong opinions about the X-Men. I mean, I knew something was off. I'd always known something was off, that my relationship to gender was messy and uncomfortable, but gender itself struck me as messy and uncomfortable, and it had never been a large enough part of how I defined myself to really feel like something that merited further study, and I had deadlines, and so it was always on the back burner. So I looked, I looked at um, what I had, at this, this improbable group of exclusively male characters. And I, I, I looked and I figured that if they, this wasn't me, then it had to be a result of the stories I had access to, to choose from, and the entertainment landscape I was looking at. And the funny thing is, I wasn't wrong exactly. I just wasn't right either. See, the characters I'd written about had one other significant trait in common aside from their gender, 
which is that they were all more or less explicitly, more or less heavily coded as autistic. And I thought, ah, yes, this explains it. This is underrepresentation in fiction echoing underrepresentation in life and vice versa. Because the, char the characteristics that I'd honed in on, that I particularly identified with in these guys, were things like emotional unavailability and social awkwardness and granular obsession. And all of those are characteristics that are seen as unsympathetic and therefore unmarketable in female characters. Which is also why readers weren't, were, were assuming that I was a man. Because, you see, here's the thing. I'm not the only one who uses stories to navigate the world. I'm just a little more deliberate about it. For humans, stories form the bridge between data and understanding. They're where we look when we need to contextualize something new or to recognize something we're pretty sure we've seen before. They're how we identify ourselves. And they're how we locate ourselves and each other in the larger world. There were no fictional women like me. There weren't representations of women like me in media. And so readers were primed not to recognize women like me in real life either. Now, by this point, I had started writing a follow-up essay. And this one was also about um, autism and narratives, but specifically focused on, on how they intersected with gender and representation in media. And in context of this essay, I, was, I, I went about looking to see if I could find even one female character who had that cluster of traits I'd been looking for. And I was asking around in autistic communities. And I got a few more or less useful one-off suggestions and some really, really splendid arguments about semantics and standards. And um, I, then I got one, one answer over and over and over in community after community after community. Leverage, people told me. You have to watch Leverage. So I watched Leverage. Leverage is five seasons of ensemble heist drama. It's about a team of very skilled con artists who take down corrupt and powerful plutocrats and the like. And um, it's a lot of fun, and it's very clever, and it's clever enough that it doesn't really matter that it's pretty formulaic, and I enjoyed it a lot. But what's most important, what Leverage has, is Parker. Parker is a master thief, and she is the best of the best of the best in ways that all of Leverage's characters are the best of the best. And superficially, she looks like the kind of woman you see on TV. So she's young, and she's slender, and she's blonde, and she's attractive, but in a sort of approachable way. And all of that familiarity is brilliant misdirection, because the thing is, there are no other women like Parker on TV. Because Parker, even if it's never explicitly stated in the show, Parker is coded incredibly clearly as autistic. Parker is socially awkward. Her speech tends to have limited inflection. What inflection it does have is repetitive and sounds rehearsed a lot of the time. She's not emotionally literate, she struggles with it. And the social skills she develops over the series, she learns by rote, like they're just another grift. When she's not scaling skyscrapers or cartwheeling through laser grids, she wears her body like an ill-fitting suit. Parker moves like me. And Parker, Parker was a revelation. She was this revolution unto herself. In a media landscape where unempathetic women usually exist to either be punished or loved whole, Parker got to play the crabby savant. And she 
wasn't emotionally intuitive, but it was never ever played as the product of abuse or trauma, even though she had survived both of those. It was just part of her as much of, as were her hands or her eyes. And she had a genuine character arc. My God, she had a genuine romantic arc even. And none of that required her to turn into anything other than what she was. And in Parker, I recognized a thousand ticks and details of my life and my personality. But I didn't recognize myself. Why? Uh, what, what difference was, was there in Parker, you know, between Parker and the other characters I'd written about? Those characters, they'd, they'd spanned ethnicities and backgrounds and, and different media and appearances, and the only other characteristic they all had in common was their gender. So that was where I started to look next, and I thought, well, okay, maybe, maybe it's masculinity. Maybe if Parker were less feminine, she'd, she'd click with me the way those other characters had, so you know, I tried to imagine a Parker with short hair who was explicitly butch, and nothing. So, okay, I extended it in what seemed like the only logical direction to extend it, and I said, well, if it's not masculinity, what if it's actual maleness? What if Parker were a man? Ah, uh, yeah. In the end, Everything changed and nothing changed, which is often the way that it goes for me. At a landmark, no matter how slight, and the map is irrevocably altered. At a landmark and paths that were invisible before open wide. At a landmark and you may not have moved, but suddenly you know where you are and where you can go. I wasn't going to tell this story when I started planning this talk. I was going to tell a similar story. It was about, it was about stories like this is. Um, it was about narratives and the ways that they influence our culture and vice versa. And it centered around a group of women at NASA who had basically rewritten the narrative around space exploration. And it was a lot more fun. And I still think it was more interesting. <laughs> but. It's also a story you can probably work out for yourselves. In fact, it's a story some of you probably have if you follow that kind of thing, which you probably do, given that you're here. And this is a story, this, my story is not a story that I like to tell. It's not a fun story to talk about because it's very personal and I am a very private person. And it's not universal. And it's not always relatable. And it's definitely not aspirational. And it's not the kind of story that you tend to encounter unless you're already part of it, which is why I'm telling it now. Because the thing is, I'm not the only person who uses stories to parse the world and navigate it. I'm just a little more deliberate because I'm tired of having to rely on composite sketches. Open your maps. Add a landmark. Reroute accordingly.